an Archeodeath publication review. Hello Archeodeathlings and welcome to another Archeodeath publication review. And I've done a whole series of these that uh, give you a little introduction to some of my past publications so that if you're looking for them online, you're not able to access them directly, um, maybe you're going to um, interlibrary loan them from your library or perhaps you want to download segments from different academia edu sites or humanities common sites, you have a flavour of the entire volume. And I want to finish with my um, the last uh, review of one of my twi um, older publications this is a, a co-edited collection um, of, a, of an academic journal um, or book series. They, they, they call it a journal, but it's really a book series um, produced by the Oxford University Committee for Archaeology. Um, this is a school of archaeology as it is now the Anglo-Saxon studies in archaeology and history series and I, I was had the proud privilege of co-editing volume 14 they put my co-editor Sarah Semple who was the series editor or journal editor at the time solely on the cover but within the front page it rightly credits me as well so there you are uh, because the special issue uh, stemmed from a conference i organized at the university of exeter um, called early medieval mortuary practices and uh, so i used the early medieval broader um, frame of reference even though um, quite a few of the papers are on Anglo-Saxon uh, in other words southern eastern British uh, material because quite a few other papers look at Viking stuff and western Britain and northern British material so it's a really um, a packed edited collection it's one of the biggest I think it's the biggest well, um, Anglo-Saxon studies and archaeology and history ever uh, and there's a number of reasons for that because within its pages not only are there the proceedings of the conference which um, are spread across an introduction by me where I outline a new theoretical approach as to how we interpret early medieval burial data but also I look at the public archaeology of early medieval graves and I look at some of the ethical issues surrounding how we excavate display and curate human remains themes that I was going to pick up in later publications but then there's also three chunky sections um, exploring proceedings from the conference and then at the end um, there are two edited by Sarah Semple two excavation reports to boot so one of, of an early Anglo-Saxon cemetery at Gunthorpe in P P uh, Peterborough uh, that one's by uh, Philippa Patrick Charles uh, French and Christine Osborne but there's also a paper by Katrina Gibson uh, on Minerva an early Anglo-Saxon mixed rite cemetery at Alwilton in Cambridgeshire so those are important excavation reports in and of themselves at the end of the volume um, so it came to a chunky 250 pages it's really meaty edited collection um, but the, the, the front material the, the first sort of uh, four fifths of the book um, um, right up to page 200 or so 204 is the proceedings of the conference so it, it's at a four size that's still rather meaty and it's a full that's kind of amount of material and um, in many ways this is the last time in 2007 it was published the last time there was an edited collection on early medieval mortuary practice in the island of Britain there were uh, there's earlier and later books that look specifically at Anglo-Saxon burial and there are um, earlier and later books that have a broader chronology and uh, a narrower chronology but this is the only real last time there was an edited collection on early medieval burial in Britain um, and uh, there are three key sections after my introduction uh, part one new perspectives on early medieval mortuary practices um, has five contributions each of which brings new perspectives at the time and I think still there's valid really valuable things to say has to have they have valuable things to say about how we approach burial data Heinrich Herker a then of the University of Reading looks at the thorny issues of ethnicity race and migration in mortuary archaeology and an attempt at a short answer to that those those ongoing uh, controversial issues then we have Susanna Harkenbeck, who looks at situational ethnicity and nested identities, new approaches to an old problem and, and a diff different take, but also taking forward that approach to ethnicity and identity in the burial record. Topics which are still timely, but there's something for everyone to read there that will be still relevant for your, your essays and your research. Then Rick Hoggett looks at um, not ethnicity, but at faith, faith. And he looks at the relationship of the 7th century burial rituals in East Anglia and the conversion to Christianity in his chapter, Charting Conversion, Burial as a Barometer of Belief? Question mark. Then 
Zoe Devlin um, of the University of York at the time looks at social memory, material culture and commun community identity in early medieval mortuary practices, looking at how we can look at memory in the deployment of grave goods and burial position and posture with the dead. She looks at early Anglo-Saxon burials as her case study. And the fifth paper in that first section is by Martin Rundqvist. Looks, he does a survey of early medieval burial studies in Scandinavia from 1994 to 2003, which is just about where the conference, uh, when the t conference took place, um, to, to give that sort of overview of approaches to burial analysis from a Scandinavian perspective. And now obviously it's 15 years out or 13 years out of date or so thereabouts, but I think it still does provide a valuable sort of insight into um, the, the approaches uh, we are taking. So the first part, um, after my introduction, is all about broad new approaches, looking at ethnicity, faith, memory, and comparative Scandinavian perspectives. And then the second section is called Studying Early Medieval Graves, and that has six papers. Uh, Becky Gowland looks at beyond ethnicity, looking at symbols of social identity from the 4th to 6th century in England. So her doctoral research looked at late Roman into early Anglo-Saxon burial ritual and tries to look at the, the similarities and the differences across that material. Then I look at uh, transforming body and soul, toilet implements in early Anglo-Saxon graves. So I explore the significance of, of, of uh, tweezers, shears, um, razors and combs. Uh, but I particularly, in a, this is a parallel paper to a paper I did in early medieval Europe journal where I looked at combs. Here I'm particularly looking at uh, the, the bronze and iron full-sized and miniature items placed with the cremated dead and I compare that with how contemporary inhumation graves are receiving those items in early Anglo-Saxon graves. Chris Fern also looks at early Anglo-Saxon graves but he looks at the interesting issue of horse burial, early Anglo-Saxon horse burial of the 5th to 7th centuries AD and it's a, a, a very, um, while common in cremation practices in the 5th and early 6th centuries, uh, the sacrifice and uh, cremation of a horse, he looks at the broader pattern of inhumation and cremation and how horses are deployed in mortuary ritual. And a third paper, or a well, fourth paper, of Becky Gowland, Howard Williams, Chris Ferner, and then the fourth paper on early Anglo-Saxon mortuary rituals. Susan Harrington, another big name in, in early medieval burial archaeology, she looks soft at soft furnished burial, an assessment of the role of textiles in early Anglo-Saxon inhumations with a particular reference to East Kent. Some of the richest graves we have from early medieval Britain come from the 5th to 7th century in East Kent. So she really makes the case for the importance of how we often underplay not only textiles as evidence of clothing the dead, but also textiles as evidence of of, of actually framing the grave, of, of, of un linings and coverings um, to furnish the grave with soft furnishings. So um, those four papers look at sort of the 5th to 7th centuries, or 4th to 7th centuries, but then we have, complementing that, two papers on later Anglo-Saxon burial ritual, and these individuals uh, go on to do their own co-edited um, collection on later Anglo-Saxon burial rituals. But first up we have jo Joe Buckbury on sacred ground, social identity and churchyard burial in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire um, circa 700 to 1100 um, AD. And so she looks at her, um, this is from her doctoral research, looking at the osteological and the cultural evidence of um, grave goods, grave linings and furnishings and um, from um, the sort of middle and later Anglo-Saxon period. And complementing that, the final paper of the section by Anya Christina Cherison looks at disturbing the dead, urbanisation of the church and post-burial treatment of human remains in early medieval Wessex, circa 600 to 1100 AD. Now that's a topic that's picked up in, in the last decade or so as a really sort of um, exciting area of debate. Why are older graves you know, re re-entered. Why do we, is it grave robbing? Is it disturbance to continue using the same burial area? Well, she has a, an exploration and discussion of that, of that issue. So we've looked at burial ritual and broad debates and then graves as a sort of as a frame of, of, of discussion and variability between individual graves. And the third section is called Death, Burial and the Early Medieval Landscape. And here there are six further chapters that look more at spatial aspects of mortuary ritual. Now Stuart Brooks, another big name in early medieval archaeology, um, has a paper on walking with Anglo-Saxons. 
um, landscapes of the dead in early Anglo-Saxon Kent. And he takes a landscape perspective on the location of burials in relation to movement of roots and uh, roots of movement, sorry, <laughs> and also in relation to um, political boundaries, emerging and evolving territorial identities. Nick Studley, uh, another well-known name from early Anglo-Saxon burial studies, um, looks at new perspectives on cemetery relocation in the 7th century AD. The example of Portway Andover, so that big topic of cemetery dislocation or movement, and, and, and is this to do with Christianity or a territorial, social, political, economic reorganisation? Well, he tackles that with a new case study from Hampshire. Um, and then we, um, one could say, finally, we have get outside of the Anglo-Saxon sphere. I mean, the conference was did have a southern British focus and a southern eastern British focus. But uh, David Petz with De Sitio Bretianao and Egluini on their bedai, um, the writing about burial in early medieval Wales. And this is a, a very a, another big name in early medieval archaeology, um, known for his work on uh, late Roman sites and their transition with Binchester, but also the uh, Lindisfarne Monastery. Uh, most recently, but he, he is a he, he is here writing from his doctoral research, extending from his doctoral research, looking at burial in early medieval Wales. Stephen H. Harrison, uh, now at Glasgow University, um, separating separated from the foaming maelstrom, landscapes of insular Viking burial. Undecided this paper, but it's one of his key published papers looking at the landscapes of furnished burial in the Viking Age, Viking furnished burial. And he sort of critiques a lot of the preconceived assumptions we have about that, that sort of 9th, early 10th century maybe even later, furnished burial tradition in, in Ireland and Man and Scotland, as well as England, and um, I think he has a few possible case studies in Wales, um, but he looks at that broader uh, insular package of how burial is taking place, uh, both at ecclesiastical sites and elsewhere in the landscape. Ifa Teta, one of my uh, um, uh, colleagues from the University of Reading in former days, um, and a collaborator on uh, in, in another book, um, uh, a question of priority, the reuse of houses and barrows for burials in Scandinavia in the late Iron Age, AD 600 to 1000. Again, a theme that's been taken up by more recent work, looking at the, the significance of the house as a place uh, when as a ruin used for burial or even a treated like a, 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 a human body or treated like an identity in death, but also burials associated with those um, uh, those those houses. And then we come back to the um, to Britain with a spatial paper by Dawn Hadley, uh, again another famous ca person from um, Viking studies. Particularly, um, she call, uh, her paper is called "The Garden Gives Up Its Secret Secrets: The Development Developing Relationship Between Rural Settlements and Cemeteries in se uh, circa 750 to 1100." So she's looking at the the, the more detailed, fine grained interplay revealed at different sites in, in the East Midlands between burial and settlement evidence. Wow. So that's a big long review for you of all the different uh, uh, chapters, and I haven't obviously been able to go into their into their details in any regard. But from a conference that took place in two thousand and four, edited and published with the able expert help of uh, Sarah Semple um, of Durham University, now Professor Sarah Semple, um, this 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 really is a. Um, a, a really long-standing um, and important collection, uh, individual papers here that have gems of interpretation that I think uh, have been picked up and developed by others and others that I think have yet to be really explored and tackled and challenges and questions put forward and proposed. And it's not the only one. An earlier book um, co-edited by uh, Andrew Reynolds and Sam Lucy from 2002 uh, uh, um, burial in early medieval England and Wales also has a rich range of studies and I think that book from 2002 and this one from 2007 really set up a, a new era for early medieval burial studies and particularly early Anglo-Saxon burial studies middle and later Anglo-Saxon burial studies probably just as much and the subsequent co-edited book by uh, Buckbury and Cherison on later Anglo-Saxon burial is also an important valuable volume. So um, I hope that's useful as a little summary of an academic book that's meaty. I won't go through the two excavation reports at the end but they have important gems. I, I particularly love the All Walton report because some fantastic cremation burials there with combs I, I can recommend. But the, you know uh, from the proceedings of the conference uh, a really uh, uh, detailed set of papers. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, 
uh, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 18, including my introduction. So that's an 18 chapter um, sort of uh, beefy set of studies. Uh, and I, I, in terms of my own chapter in the book, um, in, in terms of my work on toilet implements, and I was very uh, delighted to see that was has been influential in museum displays. And it's also been useful and cited in subsequent excavation reports where they've been finding cremation burials with uh, tweezers and razors and... Um, uh, shears and other items, toilet, toilet cosmetic items. Um, so um, that's worth having a look at. Um, so I hope that review is useful. Uh, do subscribe to my YouTube channel and do um, do look at some of the other publication reviews because while these books may be um, slightly older, um, I think they still have a major contribution to make to ongoing scholars and students work. Thank you. Follow Archeodeath on WordPress or you'll never learn.